We have been in the book of Genesis, and I tell you, it's, it's an exciting book for me because I know that uh, it, it really is under attack a lot in, in our world today, but we can learn a lot, and even just the video we watched, we see why we need things like the wordless book because sin enters the world and you know that problem sin starts and so um, it's it's a it's a neat thing so we first started in week one with creation that we were created in his image then in week two the fall of man when sin enters the world then we talked about genealogies and Noah's Ark and then we talked about the Tower of Babel and it kind of led us up to Abram. And I tell you, I don't know, uh, you know, this whole week as I've been focusing on Abram, I've been singing, I don't know if you know that song, Father Abraham had many sons, many sons had Father Abraham. Yeah, I've, that's been in my head so much, and like I'll catch myself, right hand, left hand, right foot, left foot, yeah. So, <laughs> you know, um, I, I learned those in vacation Bible school many, many years ago. But I tell you, it, it's fun to even go back and read through what uh, God does through his servant of Abram. And um, so that leads us to last, um, or, yeah, last week we briefly talked about him. I mean, just briefly. And we uh, talked about his father, Terah, and how um, his brother had passed away. And so Lot was with his, or with Terah and Abram. And then he, we, you know, again, we find out that Abram's wife, Sarai, was a barren. Then they moved from Ur to Haran, just north of the promised land. And then we see that's where Terah dies. And that kind of leaves Abram and Lot and then everybody that was with them. So we find ourselves in Genesis 12, chapter 12. And we very quickly get to the covenant, the promise. We see in Genesis 12, 1 through 9, God appears to Abram and he gives him a promise. So let's look. The Lord had said to Abram, go from your country, your people, and your father's household to the land I will show you. I will make you into a great nation I will bless you. I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and I will curse whoever curse you. And all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. So Abram went as the Lord had told him, and Lot went with him. Abram was 75 years old when he set out from Haran. He took his wife, Sarai, his nephew, Lot, and all the possessions they had accumulated and the people they had acquired in Haran, and they set out to the land of, land of Canaan, and they arrived there. Abram traveled through the land as far as the site of the great tree of Morah at Shechem. At the time of to the Canaanites were in the land, the Lord appeared to Abram, and said to your offspring, I give this land. So he built an altar there to the Lord who had appeared to him. From there he went on toward the hills of Bethel and pitched his tent. And Bethel went, or and oh, sorry, with Bethel on the west and Ai to the east. There he built an altar to the Lord and called on the name of the Lord. Then Abram set out and continued toward Negev. You know, first, I find it extremely impressive. Here at 75 years old, God tells him, take everything that's with you, leave your father's you know, family, go to the land I will show you. That's an amazing thought that he, Abram, had the faith that when God said go, he didn't go, now wait a minute. I, I, I've i got, now I, we need to get a moving company. We need to, you know, he didn't start going through all this stuff. He believed it. He said, yes, 
And even when he gets there, what does he do? He builds an altar to the Lord for thanks. That's amazing, the faith he has. But when we break down his promise, go to the land I will show you. He's going to show him where to go, exactly where to land. He will make you into a great nation. But he had no kids. I will bless you. And then I will bless those who bless you, and I will curse those who don't. Those are some pretty powerful promises. And it would have been so easy for Abram to go, wait a minute, wait a minute. I don't know where you're sending me. I don't have kids that you're going to make me into a great nation. What do you mean you're going to bless me and bless those? Who, you know, like, I don't understand. But he obeys. God says, go. God says, do it. And he says, yes. And off he goes. He gathers them up and he goes. God made a promise. But he also calls Abram to action. Have you ever noticed that? A lot of times when God says, you know, I'm going to do this, it causes we are to go and do something as well. We need to, you know, have that action. Abram had action. He could have said, you know, I'm going to wait until, you know, or, or I need a different sign. No, he said, yes, I'm going. God makes him that promise. And so many times we get called to do things, and what do we do? We question. We, we say, wait a minute, wait a minute. I don't, this, this goes against what I was thinking. And no, 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 Lord, I need you to send me a different sign. And, and you know, like we, we do all this stuff. And a lot of it just boils down to fear, doesn't it? Well, but if I take this step, what if? We want to know every little thing about every little thing before we take a step, don't we? Lord, ex explain how this is going to happen. Da, 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 da. And we can do that with simple things. You know, the Lord tugs on our heart to talk to somebody about, about Christ. But Lord, what if they reject me? Or what if they think I'm being too pushy? Or what if they just yell at me? Or what if they just turn and walk away? Or what, what if, what if, what if, what if, what if, what if? That's what we do. And guys, again, I'm, I'm the same thing. I, or I do the same thing. Or God says, this is what I want to do through you. And then you have to wait. Who here loves to wait? I mean, none, we want it right now. You know, okay, God, you showed me this. This is what I need to do. I've taken this step and nothing is happening. Sometimes we've got to wait and that's a hard thing to do but if you think about what God says to Abram everything God said happened everything he never got to see a lot of it that's another thing that I mean that really hit me this week he didn't get to see all the fulfillment. He didn't get to see the great nation. He didn't get to see, um, you know, I'll make you a great nation. He didn't get to see the fulfillment of the whole promised land. He didn't get to see all the ins and outs of what God was really doing through Abram. But think about this, in, according to Exodus 12, 30, or verse 37, by the time the Israelites left Egypt, there were 600,000 men plus women and children. God made a great nation out of Abram. He didn't get to see that. 
And I mean, what an amazing, from a man who could have very easily said, I don't even have kids. How are you going to do this? God did it. God did it. His name is great. Think about it. From Christians to the Jewish culture, even the Muslims think of Abraham, who is Abram. His name is great. They speak so highly. We speak highly of Abraham. We've made songs about Abraham. He hasn't got to see that. He didn't get to see the, how his name was and is great. But what we know is that when God says, do it, we take that step. We say, yes. We might not even see the continued ramifications. And that ramifications isn't bad, but I mean, we might not get to see all of that. There was a time in a youth group that I went to, I watched as this kid stood up and he gave his testimony, you know, I came to know Christ and da 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 da, da. Uh, It was through my friend, and his friend came up, he introduced me to Christ. And it's because of him, I'm here today. And so then it came to that friend's time, and he goes, you know, God really laid this person on my heart, but there was a time where I didn't know Christ. And so I, you know, I, I was lost, and, and he goes, but it was because of this person that I came to know Christ and up stood that person. And it was such a beautiful picture of how, A, when we're obedient, we don't always see the trickle-down effect. When we witness to that person, maybe they don't accept Christ right there. Maybe it's down the road a little bit, but because of what you said and did, it caused this and this. And this. But then we don't always think about that person you led to Christ who they're leading to Christ and who they're leading to Christ, and it just becomes this spread out effect. But you see, when God says do it, and we do it, he blesses. But it can be scary. It can be, you can't tell me at 75, all settled with his family, and God says go, that he didn't like, okay, I'll do it, there had to have been a, at least a little heart flutter or something, <laughs> you know? There had to have been something. But when he obeyed, when he got there, what did he do? He glorified the Lord. He glorified God. When he gets to the land, he gets there, he uproots everything, and he goes. We find in Genesis 12, 10 through 20, that when Abram is in the land, when he first gets there, famine hits. One of the first things that occurs. So he goes down to Egypt. We see Abram, and he, he's worried. He's like, okay, Sari, you know, you're pretty. I mean, you're pretty. So when we get down there, I need you to tell people you're my sister so they won't kill me because they'll, they'll see how pretty you are and they'll want to marry you, the, the pharaoh, the, the officials, and all that type stuff. And it happens, and pharaoh sees, and he takes her. <laughs> He gives Abram all this stuff like, hey, uh, you know, this is great. But then we see God says, no, 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 no. <laughs> and some things hit in um, Pharaoh's court. And they know it's the Lord. And so they kind of give Sari back. And they're like, why didn't you tell me? Why didn't you tell me? <laughs> and so um, they, they get back together. And then they go back up to uh, the promised land. And again, you know, you wonder why that that he worried about. That why, here again, he goes down there and he's like, okay, you've got to tell people you, that, you know, that we're brother and sister. I don't know why that. 
I don't know why there was that stumble. I think it lets us know that Abram was, was human. He still had fear. That's why I kind of think, even though he said yes and amen and they moved, that there had to have been a little bit of a heart flutter, like, ooh, okay, this is a big move. We're doing it. But we know, you know, they survived this, um, this little interaction down in Egypt. And we then get to Genesis 13, and we see where Abram is being blessed. Because remember, what did God say? I will bless you. And then God's also blessing Lot, and there it's kind of becoming too much. And so they decide to separate. Like, okay, you go this way, I'll go this way, and then all will be well. And what we see is that Abram lands in Canaan and Lot goes to the Sodom area. And we find that when they settle in there, that again, God is fulfilling his promise. The land is his. God promises the land. We even see where Lot gets in trouble with some of the people in Sodom, and they try to, I mean, all of uh, chapter 13, or all 14, I mean, Abram has to go in and rescue Lot. Abram has to go in and say, nope, I've, I've got you. We're going uh, we're gonna to win here, and, and he does. He wins, and, you know, Abram doesn't even take, like, he doesn't even take the spoils. He's like, eh, no, that's fine. Um, but it, it shows here yet again the fulfillment. God blesses those who bless him, and they, he curses those who curse. Abram is strong because of, uh, because of God. But here's an amazing thing, and this is when we get into chapter 15. A great nation... I think this, you know, the land, I'm sure he could have really, yeah, God can do that. But the great nation, I'm sure, had to bother Abram. How are you going to do this, Lord? So let's look. Genesis 15, 1 through 3. After this, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision. Do not be afraid, Abram. I am your shield, your very great reward. But Abram said, Sovereign Lord, what can you give me since I remain childless? And the one who will inherit my estate is Eliezer of Damascus. And Abram said, You have given me no children, so a servant in my household will be my heir. He's finally having the conversation about a great nation. How are you going to do this? A servant is my heir. I don't have a kid. He couldn't see. Like, how are you going to do this, God? But what does God say in verses 4 and 5? Then the word of the Lord came to him. This man will not be your heir, but a son who is your own flesh and blood will be your heir. He took him outside and said, look up at the sky and count the stars. If indeed you can count them, he said to him, so shall your offspring be. I'm childless and you keep telling me this is going to happen. A great nation. He kind of thinks, well, it's going to be through a servant. And God says, no, it's going to be your flesh and blood. It's going to happen. I'm sure there had to have been like, okay, wait a minute. I don't get this. How are you going to do this? And then we see in Genesis uh, verse 6, Abram believed the Lord and he credited it to him. As righteousness he believed even when everything you know like all the odds were stacked against him 
God says it's going to happen, and he says, okay, and then it is credited to him as righteousness. What an amazing thought, isn't it? When we cling to his promises, when we believe his promises, Abram did, and he was credited as righteous. Guys, there's been times where I've been like, now wait a minute, how is this going to happen? I don't understand. But God says, do it, so we do it. And then 99.9% .9 of the time, I look back and I go, why did I even question? You know, there was one little inkling, you know, times where I've been like, okay, God can do that. <laughs> but most of the time I'm like, I don't see it. I don't understand it. But it happened. And I'm like, I did not even expect it to happen that way. I didn't understand. You see, the word of God is filled with promises, isn't it? We look at what he has promised in this book, in his living word. And just like that first hymn we sang, standing on the promises, we can stand on his promises. What I've learned is that I know we might not understand how it's going to be fulfilled, but we've got a God who, who knows. We might not see how it will even be possible we might even take that step saying, I, I don't even know how this is going to happen. But God says, take the step and I'll walk it with you. We can rest in his promises. Feelings come and go. There's been times where I've not felt like it. Have you ever felt that way? It's like, oh, I really don't want to do that. <laughs> but out of obedience, we do it. Maybe we're scared. Maybe, you know, again, fill in the blank. Maybe in those moments where God says, come on, we are so scared we don't want to do it. Or maybe we're so angry we don't want to do it. Feelings come and feelings go. And I tell you, that's a that's a humbling thought at times times where I say I don't feel him around I don't feel this I don't feel that but there are other times where I feel that way when we stand on his promises it doesn't matter what we're feeling there are times I don't feel like God is with me but he has promised me he will neither leave me nor forsake me whether I feel it or not he's with me that's a powerful thought. How do I know that? Because he's promised it. And we can stand on his promise. Maybe we've done something and it feels like it didn't come out the way we wanted it to. That's happened to me before. I've thought, hey, yeah, this needs to, this is how it's gonna happen, and it just completely goes the different direction. And I'm left going, well, okay, now what just happened? Lord, I thought if I did this, and I can rest in the fact I don't understand the whole picture like he does. And sometimes that's difficult. It's difficult to let go of the fact that, well, that didn't happen the way I wanted it to happen. That's not my job. My job is obedience. My job is that he said, do it. I'm going to do it no matter the cost. Throughout all of the Christianity especially, think about how many people have died because of their faith. They have stood up and said, you will not do this. You know, they're going to continue to preach the word of God, and they've died for it. I'm sure you can ask their families like, hey, wait a minute. God tells you to share your faith and you do it and you die. That's not standing on a promise. Yes, it is. He said, do it. And through, through my obedience, 
he's going to make a blessing, even out of something like that. Even death couldn't stop the gospel. It continued to move on. Today, we've focused on promises. We're going to continue the story of Abram, and we're going to see how even at times, Abram and even Sarah step out, and they try to make things happen on their own. And it doesn't go over too good. <laughs> you see, when God says do it, do it. It might not happen the way you think. It might not be exactly how you formulated it in your brain. But let's be like Abram and believe God, and it will be credited to us. I mean, like that would, that's cool, isn't it? That God says, yes, that is what I want is obedience. Now we know it's Jesus Christ that has made us righteous. But I mean, just our obedience. God loves that. He takes care of it. He does it. it might, again, it might not come out the way we think, or maybe it comes out exactly the way we thought. We are to obey. Where are you today? Has God called you to do something, and you don't know how it's going to happen, or you don't know what's going to happen when you take that step? Obey. Have you taken a step and it's scary? You want to turn back and run the other way? You think, no, I, I got it all wrong? Obey. Maybe it didn't work out the way you thought. Obey. Maybe you're in a time of waiting. Obey. No matter what, when God says this is going to happen, it's going to happen. We can stand on his promises. You know, today, it's always, it's, it's, it's always an amazing time when we start to think about communion. And I thought today, as we go into communion, what an amazing thought that our God promised to save us. He saved us, and he's got plans for us. But he's also promised us that when we leave this life, we will be with him in glory. In taking communion, we are able to stand on his promises because of what he did. And what a blessing the fact that we are able to, to just say, Lord, you did this for me. He took on our sin. He took our punishment. If you grew up with a sibling, you know, you would not take your brother or sister's punishment for anything. I mean, I wouldn't have. <laughs> but Jesus said, I'll do it. He says, I'll make a way. Now, I love that song, God will make a way where there seems to be no way. I know those people, when they gathered up in the upper room and they're taking that very first communion and he's saying, you know, do this in remembrance of me. This is my body. This is my blood. They didn't fully grasp it. You know, you think when they, when they got to the garden, they came to arrest Christ. They scatter. I can't imagine the hopelessness they felt knowing that he was nailed to a cross. And I'm sure they were like, it's over. They didn't see they didn't see the whole picture. That day when the ladies went to the tomb and they go in there and he's gone and they panic. Somebody has stole his body. No. He's conquered death. He conquered sin. And he 
rose victoriously. She's all upset. Mary's all upset. And then she hears her Savior. It is I. You see, when, when God makes a promise, he keeps it. We might not understand. Those disciples, Jesus' mother, they didn't fully understand until they saw. And so many people, even today, they go, you don't know what I've done. You don't know what I've this or that. I don't, but there's a God in heaven who does. And he says, it is forgiven. He throws it as far as the east is from the west. Today, we come and we celebrate communion. We celebrate a promise that was made to us. He tells us to remember. I invite you to take your, your elements. You see, the Bible says the only way of forgiving sin, for God to forgive sin, was the shedding of blood. And when he sat in that upper room, he was with his disciples and he took the bread. He broke it and he said, this is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Lord, we come before you, and as we remember the bread, Lord, we remember that every, every beating, every thorn that pierced your brow, We remember that you were nailed to the cross for us. You took our punishment. Lord, we say thank you. Lord, we, we just say thank you. We love you, Lord. It's in Jesus' name we pray. You know, as part of the Passover, I've read where, you know, there's different cups during that time, and, and they, they think that when he took the cup and he said, this is my blood, that it was the cup that actually represented redemption, the redeemed. And I thought, you know, what a beautiful picture, especially if that's true. But even if it, you know, if it wasn't, the, and we don't know, we don't know for sure. But what did he do for us? Because he shed his blood, he redeemed us. His blood covered our sin. When he shed that blood on the cross, it was for us. We no longer have to go and sacrifice animals and, and do this because of his blood. So he took that cup. He said, this is my blood shed for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Jesus, we say thank you. You have forgiven us. And Lord, just like Abram, we can stand on your promises. Lord, you promised to save us through your son and you have. You have promised us an eternal glory, and we will receive it. Lord, I thank you that you've given us your word, that we can stand on those promises, and we know whether we feel it or not, you are with us. Lord, we thank you. We celebrate today as, as brothers and sisters in Christ what you've done for us. Lord, again, we thank you through the message of Abram and everything you did there and that we 
still many years later can learn from your servant. The Lord, the only thing we can, we can say is that he obeyed. Lord, you, you made the impossible possible. You poured out your blessings. So Lord, even though you did that with your servant Abram, we praise you for what you did there. Lord, again, we thank you that we can stand on your promises. It's in Jesus' name. Amen.